Hi, and welcome to Truth or Consequences with Ryan Atkinson from Lakewood and Sean Griffith from Sojourn Community Church. How this game works is we're going to ask a true or false question. If Ryan gets it right, it passes. But if Ryan gets it wrong, I take the liquid of choice, in this case water, and pour it on Ryan. But it gets worse. After water comes, of course, lemonade. Then we have tomato juice. And finally, we have that milk that we left out before quarantine. A little chunky. Uh, yeah, chunky. Not going to be pretty. Not creamy. <laughs> Our lovely assistant, Chloe, is going to ask the question. You cannot smell when you're sleeping. True or false? Everyone knows that one. <laughs> yeah, obviously. One. Every. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go with you cannot smell. True, you cannot smell when you're sleeping. I'm glad you're true. It is true. true. It is true. Yes, okay. Yes. The inventor of the light bulb, Thomas Edison, was afraid of the dark. Or I've heard this before. I've heard this, and I think it's a old wise tale. Um, I'm gonna say false. True. It's true. It is yes! true. Oh, I'm so happy. We'll do a little slow pour, and <laughs> there it goes. Ooh, that's cool. that's <laughs> what I thought. <laughs> Next one. A chicken once lived for 18 months without a head. True or false? <laughs> See, I, I think there's no way that could be true, but reverse psychology. I'm going true. Yep, it's true. Come on! <laughs> How? I'm going to get that wrong. Uh, this is a bad game. I, mean, I love this uh, game. Yeah, just go. A polar bear skin is black. True or false? True. True. The first food grown and eaten in space was potatoes. True. It's false. Oh, I knew yeah. it. Oh, it's baby. Oh, oh, it's cold. Yeah. It's very... It's illegal in Georgia to eat fried chicken with a knife and fork. <laughs> In Georgia? Well, that's stupid. I've been to Georgia. I've always used a knife and fork. I'm going to say false. True. Yes! How is that true? Yes! Oh, I love it. I'm going to uh, challenge that one. I want to say that law on the foot. <laughs> oh, boy. Sticky, yeah. Oh! oh. oh. <laughs> that's actually kind of refreshing. Donald Duck's sister is named Donna. True or false? I'm going to say false. Yeah, that's false. Give me a softball. Give me a law. Give me a softball. <laughs> Dalmatians are born with black spots. False. You're right. Fortune cookies were invented in China. Oh, okay, that is false. Yep. The red M&M disappeared for a decade. True. Elvis Country Presley had a twin brother. True or false? False. True. Darn it! Oh! I didn't even know that. I'm an Elvis fan too. Uh, you want a little drink before yeah, you go? Uh, you go. Oh, no! Oh, <laughs> yes. Will not be oh, tasty. That, I'm not drinking. No I way. I say we double down. Double or nothing. Let's go. Double, double or nothing. Wait. Loser takes both. Okay. <laughs> it's on me. Wait, no, it's on you. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Shoot. Yeah, um, that was a dumb <laughs> idea. The first Olympics Games honored Alexander the Great. True or false? Oh, my. Oh, man. <laughs> false. Yes. Yes, no! baby. Ooh, you want a drink? Oh, a marathon nice. was named after a man named Marathon. That is true. It's false. No! It was a marathon. No! no! <laughs> I feel so bad. Oh, I thought you had that one. Oh, this make it quick, great. make it quick. Oh, it's so thick. It's so thick. It's so thick. <laughs> I never heard that because I read that one, but I didn't write that one down. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's SpaghettiOs! <laughs> An ostrich has the largest eye in the world. The ostrich has the largest eye in the world. True. False. Yes! yes! Oh! Oh, yeah. oh, no! Oh, yuck! Yeah. Oh, oh, it's not... Oh, is it bad? Oh, it's so bad. Warhead's candy was created during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Sure, false. Oh, it's so great. I mean, it's very inappropriate that they would cut That would be. She doesn't she give. She doesn't break. Don't hurt mine. Don't hurt mine. No Jedi stuff in here. False. You're right. Ah! Yes! <laughs> Darn it! Olympic gold medal is made of silver. True or false? False. It's true. Yes! No! Oh, yes! Like a glass of milk. Oh! <laughs> it's worse when it 
It's in your mouth. Welcome to Two Pastors Making Melt in <laughs> Tomato and <laughs> Lemonade. Back to Two Pastors Making Lemonade. I'm Pastor Sean with Sojourn Community Church. And I'm Pastor Ryan from Lakewood Chapel in Mays Landing. And welcome back, Sean. Thank you. For the viewers out there that may not know, uh, I got to go away for a week to Oklahoma. That's God's country, I heard. It's beautiful. <laughs> well, it's nice. It's <laughs> nice in Oklahoma. It was a little hot. Hot. But yeah. you know, it's it summer. It is. It is summer in Oklahoma. So, and oh, it's summer here. Right, yeah, which means... <laughs> We have officially been doing this for 12 weeks, Sean. 12 wow. Weeks. That's three months. That's actually in a whole summer. That, it is. I mean, now we know. I mean, wow. We are like maybe, I don't know, 200 episodes away from Friends. <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, so Oklahoma, man. You know, there's a great musical in Oklahoma. I there heard. is. There's a lot of good dancing in that one. We should do an interpretive dance of, uh, or not. Yeah. Probably, yeah I was going to say, do you think yeah. I'm ready? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, no. no, not sure that will ever happen. <laughs> but but they're they're loosening up restrictions there, right? Yes, it was great. I actually got to eat inside a oh. restaurant and sit down, wow. and I don't want to brag, but even went shopping w- without a mask. Without a mask, sans mask. It was crazy. Wow. So as you know, things are starting to open up around the country, more so in the South uh, or Midwest. But uh, it's coming our way, which means that probably within uh, I don't know weeks away from actually seeing each other face to face in some format or, right, or yeah. something. So we'll start working that we out. We see so, the eyes, right? Yeah, the eyes yeah. up with the mask. So there, there's hope ahead. We'll keep you uh, up to date each week uh, how we're progressing with that. So uh, please just continue to pray, obviously, for our leadership. Pray for wisdom as we continue to seek God uh, during this time. Yeah, and you know, and as we pray, I think one of the exciting things is we've been praying together throughout this whole pandemic that uh, the whole world really was yeah. all kind of unified in a sense that yeah. we all were battling the same disease and the same mm. fears and to some degree um, that we also want to pray because as we rejoice over things seeming to get on a right path here mm-hmm. globally yeah. um, it seems like recently our nation has taken some steps backwards and we're seeing some division we're seeing some hatred and the sin of racism is on display and um, all things that we as Christians know grieve the heart of God. Yeah. And um, I think as a church, our hearts are broken. And uh, as we rejoice in the restrictions being lifted, um, I think we need to really spend time in prayer, just crying out to God on behalf of those who re- need mercy, who need justice. Um, and uh, we want to just cry out to God that he would heal our land. So, yeah. Sean, would you mind uh, taking a moment as we start this episode and just praying that God would move in our nation and, yeah. and heal some of the sure. division? So please join us. Uh, Lord, thank you for being so gracious. Thank you for being so wise. And uh, the fact that we can look to you for direction uh, in this time, uh, Lord, we are just coming before you. Again, face down, palms mm-hmm. up before you, humbly asking you, Lord, to, to look after our nation, to, to help us in this time. And, and I pray for uh, all the cities and states across the nation right now, Lord, are, who are all facing uh, uh, difficulties as, as we go through this challenging time, that you would give uh, local leadership just wisdom and discernment, that the church would rise up and there would be peacemakers in the midst of all of this, Lord God. I pray for those who are crying out for justice, that they would be heard, Lord God, and there would be real change where change is needed, Lord. And so we pray that in the midst of all that's happening, that people would look to even a greater authority, that they would look to you, the author and perfecter of our faith, our true rock and salvation. So, Lord, I pray, I pray that people would look up, draw their strength, draw their truth, seek your love in the midst of everything that is happening right now, and that they would see the hope of Jesus even now in this time. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Sean. I know in all the intense and heart-wrenching news that we've been seeing lately, there has been a a peace that we have in knowing that Mm. we uh, have been doing this show and watching this show are praying face down, palms up, and surrender, saying, God, we long to see you move because we know that there is nothing short than a move of God that's going to take to heal the things that are wrong. So with that being said, I think we have an update on face down, palms up. We are excited about the response to face down, palms up, praying for our nation. And we think this message needs to be big and get everywhere. So I came all the way to a place where going big 
is the name of the game. Casey, Illinois has several world records for all things large. But what most caught my attention was the world's largest mailbox. What a great place to send a big message. That we need to be face down in humility and palms up in dependency. We all know the trials our nation is facing, but do not despair and do not lose hope. Rather, join us as we seek God together for our communities, our nation, and the world. Post a photo of you praying face down with your palms up on your social media and add the hashtag face down palms up. Ask your friends and families to do the same. Now that's something to write about. Pretty cool. So exciting. Two more states. We still haven't got our big fish yet. I though. know. North Dakota. Come on, North Dakota. We're running out of time. <laughs> so uh, today we're talking about the number one best-selling book in all of human history. The, the Bible. Bible. Yeah, so we thought we'd start off with a little Bible trivia to see how much you know about the, the Bible. Bible. Yeah. yeah, all right. So question number one. We obviously know that Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, but what was Luke's profession? Was he A, a physician, B, a Jedi, C, a lawyer, or D, a rabbi? Hmm. Ding, 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 <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Physician! So if you pick physician, you got that right. Good job. Which two of the following is not a book in the Bible? Nahum, Chewbacca, Obadiah, Hezekiah. If you said Chewbacca and Hezekiah, you got it right. <laughs> Woo. Good job. Those are good. Upon what mountain or mountains did Noah's Ark come to rest after the flood? Was it A, Zion, B, Ararat, C, Mordor, or D, Mount Everest? That's right. The correct answer is... Mount Ararat. Why did two bears attack a group of boys in 2 Kings chapter 2? A. They attacked the city gate. B. They stole the Ark of the Covenant. C. They didn't eat their vegetables. Or D. They called a man of God Baldy. If you chose called a man of God Baldy, you are right. Now listen, young people. You might think <laughs> it's funny to call your pastor Baldy. Ha ha! But do you see what happened to these guys? God said... Sorry. I agree. Sorry. Hey, I agree. Sorry. Those Too kids much. had it coming to them. Too much. <laughs> Just careful. Yeah. Continue. Bald, bald is beautiful, by the way. Bald is beautiful. Beautiful bald. <laughs> and now we're going to do rapid round. We're going to read a phrase, and you have to say true if it's in the Bible or false if it's not in the Bible. So true if it is in the Bible, false if it is not in the Bible. So first phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness. False. It's not in the Bible. But it's it, good for COVID, it, right? It is very good for protecting that. Um, escaping by the skin of your teeth. True. It's actually found in Job, chapter 19, verse 20. Oh, I thought it was verse 18. I, common I misconception. That, yeah. <laughs> Eat, drink, and be merry. True. Luke, chapter 12, verse 19. How about this one? This too shall pass. Actually, not in the Bible. I can't believe it. I used that one. <laughs> I, I was guilty. I know. That's my go-to comfort yeah, line. This too shall, shall pass. And it's actually not in the Bible. <laughs> wow. Okay. God helps those who help themselves. 
fuck. Ah, that's fuck. not in the Bible either. But if we had a nickel for every yeah. person who told us that. <laughs> How about this one? A house divided against itself cannot stand. True. Matthew chapter 12, verse 25. Before Abe Lincoln said it. Ah. A drop in the bucket. True. Isaiah 40, verse 15. How about this? God works in mysterious ways. False. Well, true, he does work in mysterious ways. That phrase is actually not found in the Bible. Hmm. How about this? The blind lead the blind. Are we talking about us? Or? Yeah. <laughs> it does sound. It is yeah, true. Yeah. Right. Matthew fifteen fourteen, And yeah. this has been... Bible Trivia. I'm Annalise, and welcome to Kids Time. It's really hard to read in the dark. Everyone knows you're supposed to read in the light. When you do things wrong in our life, it's kind of like reading in the dark. God wants us to live in the light and read his word in the light. And when we do both, we learn the way God wants us to live. Well... I'm up past my bedtime. Until next time.
is always by my side So as we mentioned in the beginning, we are looking at the Word of God today, the number one bestseller in human history. And, you know, it talks about in, in Romans, mm -hmm. it says that, that man can know about God through his general revelation. Uh, we can know about God when we look at his creation, mm -hmm. right? But we want to know God. And as I have been a Christian for 30 some odd years or however long it's been, I, I know that the word of God has been like such an anchor for mm. my soul. It's a place that I go to be rejuvenated, to, to seek God's will in my life, uh, to, to understand the world around me. And, and I really see the world around me through the lenses of God's word. Mm. And it's been so transformational in my life. And so we know it's really important uh, for being part of what God's doing. Yeah, yeah. We've been, you know, these past several weeks, we've been talking about seeing God move, right? Yeah. Bringing revival. And we long for it. I know you guys at home, you long for it. And we're, we're crying out for it. And what we've really been doing is saying, okay, we know God wants to move. Yeah. We want him to move. Let's go to his book, the Bible, and find out what would it take to see God move, right? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so that's what we've been doing each week. So the first week we saw that if we want to see God move, we got to be desperate. we got to yeah. be desperate for it. we got to be yeah. care enough and passionate enough to see him move, to cry out in prayer to yeah. God, begging him to move. Yeah. And then we saw the following week from his word that if we're going to see God move, we got to bring him glory and not ourselves glory, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we found out in, the, in God's word uh, last week from Pastor Zach that if we're going to see God move, we got to get the sin out, right? We got yeah. to repent. We, God's not going to move if we have sin in our lives. So that all leads us to today. And what we want to talk about today is why the Word of God is crucial to seeing God move. The last few weeks, we've been talking about seeing God move. I mean, seeing God do something supernatural, bring revival here, there, and everywhere. And the question that I've been wrestling with lately. And I really want us to wrestle with this morning is this, are we ready to see God move? Now I know we want to see God move, but are we ready to see him move? Because I don't know about you, but I want to make sure that when God chooses to do the supernatural, when he chooses to bring revival, I don't want to miss it. I want us to be a part of it. So as I've been preparing this message, it became clear that if we want to be ready to see God move, we need to return to God's word. The reason why we don't see God move more often is because we've left his word. Now you're probably thinking, wait a second, pastor, what do you mean that we've left God's word? We haven't left his word. We love the Bible. <laughs> when I say that we've left God's word, what I mean is this, not so much that we've denied it or that we've rejected it. I don't know many Christians that would do that. But what I mean is this, far too often, we don't prioritize it as the ultimate and final authority for our lives. See, we appreciate God's word, but far too often we value our opinions, our thoughts, our feelings, or the opinions of our culture more than God's word. And that's why we don't see him move. Too often we treat the Bible like the Queen of England, <laughs> right? We, we, we give it a high position like the Queen of England. She's celebrated in great ways, she, but she doesn't have authority. She doesn't get to make decisions on how England is run. They are polite to her. They bring her in and serve her coffee and tea. They overwhelm her with pomp and circumstance. And then they tell her, this is how we're going to run the country. Too often, that's what we do with the word of God. And that's why we don't see God move. We take his word and instead of it being our, our final authority, we give it pomp and circumstance. We carry it around under our arms. You know, we, we talk about our favorite verses and our favorite translations. We dress it up with nice Bible covers. We read it. We sing about it. We display it in our homes but we do not give it authority in our lives. It's not the ultimate and final authority in our lives. And because of that, we miss out on seeing God move. We're not ready for God to move because God will not move in a supernatural way in our lives until we return to his word. So how does returning to God's word get us ready to see God move? Because prioritizing God's word leads to God's blessings. I love this. In Psalm chapter 119, verses 1 and 2, the psalmist says this. He says, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. 
Psalm 119 opens with this incredible word, blessed. He's saying that this word blessed means joy, happiness, satisfaction, peace, contentment. This is everything we're praying God to bring, right? When we say for revival, we want God to bring his blessing, his favor on our lives, on our families, on our churches, in our communities, in our country, and in our world. And God says, great, because that is the life I want to give to you. I want to bring my blessing to you but it's conditional. Did you catch that? In verse one, it says that God wants to bless us, but we are only blessed when we live within the boundaries of his law. That's his word. See, this is what gets us messed up. When we start living our life and basing our decisions off of our own opinions, our own thought, and we become the authority in our lives, we lose God's blessing and favor. So many Christians think and feel this way. They feel like they get to call their own shots. And then we wonder why we don't get to see God move. We need to radically change our view of God's word. God's word is not a dusty old book filled with rules and regulations. It's not a book that tells us what we can't do. No, instead, the Bible is actually an instruction book given to us from God that says this is how you get the most out of life. (laughs) This is how you make sure that an all-powerful, all-loving God blesses you and puts his favor upon you. This is what we need in our lives, our families, our church our community, our country, and our, and our world, right? Is we need the blessing and favor of God. And God says, you get that when you follow my law, when you return to my word, when you make my word your ultimate and final authority. You see, so many times we think that God's word cancels out our fun, but it's the opposite. God isn't in heaven saying, oh, I better tell Ryan not to do this because if he does this, it's going to really make a good time for him. No, God says, I know what you don't know. And I know that if you do something that goes against my word, it's going to result in consequences. It's going to result in pain. It's going to result in heartache, not just in your life, but in the lives of those around you. God says, don't do that. Every time God says in the Bible, don't, what he's really saying is don't hurt yourself. He's saying, if you go against my word, you're going to be robbed of the joy and the blessing and the satisfaction that you desire. God gives us his word to let us know how we can experience his blessings and favor, not just individually, but collectively as a community and nation. But the opposite is true also. Psalm 119 verse 118 says this, You spurn all who go astray from your statutes, for their cunning is in vain. That word spurn there means to put out, to exclude, to reject. And what the psalmist is saying is he's saying, God wants to bring his blessing into our lives and our communities and our world. But if we go against God's word, he'll reject us, he'll spurn us. In other words, God says, when you don't make my word, when you don't return to my word and make it your ultimate authority, you're on your own. You're living outside of my protection. At best, you're living by trial and error. You know, I understand what this is like because a few months before quarantine hit, I was having some major trouble with some heartburn. So I went to the pharmacy aisle in Walmart to find something to cure it. And I found this over-the-counter medicine that looked great. It said 24-hour relief. Even had a little picture of the fire being put out in my esophagus, you know. And I was so excited to take it until I read the list of possible side effects and it includes this constipation diarrhea fatigue dizziness weakness mood changes headaches insomnia muscle pain and cramps dry mouth vomiting get this clay colored stools okay confusion hallucinations agitation well i would guess so seizures coughing up green or yellow mucus and then finally impotence which after a quick Google search, I realized was not the fancy theological term for being all powerful that I hoped it was. (laughs) When we live life outside of God's word, when his word is not our ultimate authority, we live in that sense of, I hope I get the blessing and not the side effects. You see what I'm saying? That's what we're experiencing right now as a country. That's what our world's experiencing. We are living by trial and error. We're going after things and we're making decisions that we think might bless us and might lead to joy and happiness and satisfaction. But too often we're left with the tales of the pain and scars of the possible side effects. Because without God's word, 
we don't know how to live. Without God's word, we will not experience his blessing. But not only that, but when we return to God's word and prioritize his word as the ultimate and final authority in our lives, God uses his word to make us ready for him to move because he produces godly character in us. Psalm 119 verses 9 through 10. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I don't know about you, but I love this verse. I love the passion from the psalmist here. He's writing this verse as he's looking out at the world around him that is rapidly moving away from God and his standards and his word and wants nothing to do with what God's word has to say. A world much like ours. And the psalmist who had already written about how blessed we could be if we live according to God's word, in verse 9, he's heartbroken because he looks at the world around him and he goes, but how is that even possible? How can we live and return to God's word when our world is so evil and perverse? I don't know about you, but I feel that emotion. When I look out around the things that are going on in our world, in our community, our nation right now, like the psalmist, I go, how can we ever be ready to see God move when we are so far from God's word. What would it take to get us to the place where we return to God's word in 2020? It seems impossible, right? It seems overwhelming. But I love the next verse. The psalmist answers this, this cry, this question in verse 11 of Psalm 119. He says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's the secret sauce. See, he, that word stored up there, it's a word that means literally to conceal something of great value, to treasure it. And see, this is what God's word does. God's word gets us ready to see him move because it produces in us the godly character that even our culture wants nothing to do with. You see, he says, if you just would treasure God's word as Christians, we can't control everyone else, but we can control ourselves. And if we take God's word and return to it and let God's word sink its roots deep down into the core of who we are, God, through his Holy Spirit, will use that word to transform us, to create godly character in us, and we can become the men and women that God wants to work in so that he can work through to bring revival and change to our community and our nation and our world. And we see that take place in the book of Nehemiah. I love the book of Nehemiah because it's such a great picture of revival. And when God brings revival in the book of Nehemiah to Jerusalem, it's such a perfect picture of what we're talking about this morning. You see, the city of Jerusalem was in ruins. I mean, it was just in shambles for 150 years. But then, Nehemiah, like us, developed an intense burden to see God move in his community. So he cries out to God, he gets the people united, they return to God's word, and God starts to move. And God does something great. God builds, completely rebuilds the city walls in 52 days. What couldn't have been possible for 150 years is now done in 52 days. But God didn't stop there. The people were so stirred that they call Ezra the priest, and they say, Read us the Bible. We want to know God's word. And for six hours, God's word was treasured and it broke their hearts and it, and it, and it just transformed them and started to build godly character to them. And listen to what it says in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 9. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time the Bible made you cry? If we want to be ready for God to move, we got to treasure his word and let it develop godly character us in us in such a way that the Bible ought to make you cry. Because when you know, you know you are ready for seeing God to move. You're ready for revival when God's word makes you cry. And you say, why were they crying? And let me tell you, this wasn't some crocodile tears. They were crying in such a way that later on in, in Nehemiah chapter 8, they have to be told to stop crying. And the reason why they were crying such, um, such powerful, grief-filled tears was because when they opened up the Word of God and they returned to His Word, they realized something that we need to realize, that they just spent 150 years wasting time. Because every day, without God's Word as your final and ultimate authority, is a wasted day. Many of us, we've been living year after year after year in misery and defeat and bondage and sin and brokenness and with no progress because we haven't been prioritizing God's word. How many of us as Christians go from one defeat to another, one depression to another because we haven't prioritized God's word? There are people in here listening 
that have gone from broken marriage to broken marriage to broken marriage because they haven't prioritized God's word. If only we would return to God's word and allow God to just capture our hearts with his word, let it break us down, we could finally be ready for him to bring revival. We can be ready to see God move, but only when God's word is returned to, only when we prioritize it as our ultimate and final authority. So here's the thing I want us to check with. You say, wait a second, that doesn't sound too great, right? Like I'm going to prioritize God's word, I'm going to return to God's word, and it's going to make me cry? Yeah, it'll make you cry at first. It starts with crying, but oh, it ends with joy. I love this. Listen to what it says in Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 10 through 12. It says, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. You see, this is the good news of the Bible. I love this about God's word. In the beginning, when we return to it, and God starts to use God, His Word to create godly character in you, yes, it's going to start with crying, but it always ends with rejoicing. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. We can be ready and prepared for God to move in us and through us because even though our, His Word may begin with tears, it ends with rejoicing because even though you look at your life and you go, the mess I've made, right? How could I have been so dumb to wait so long to make his word my final authority? But then you read about God's grace and mercy and forgiveness and love and you walk away rejoicing. That is what God's word does. I like how the psalmist put it in Psalm 119, 165. He says, great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. Notice he doesn't say the great peace have those who read your word. It's those who love your word. If we are willing to treasure God's word in our hearts, if we're willing to return to his word, prioritize it as our ultimate authority, allowing the Holy Spirit to use it to build godly character in our lives, there's no telling what God is ready to do. And I can't wait to see it. So I ask you this question once again. Are you ready to see God move? Because when you become ready to see him move and you return to his word, like the Israelites in the book of Nehemiah, it allows you to ask God an awesome question. You start to ask God an awesome question. And the question is this, <laughs> what else can God do? I want us to get to the place as a church where we start asking God, what else can you do? We read his word and we start to see the change in the character that he forms in us. And we say, if God can bring a breakthrough in my life, what else can God do, right? If God can bring a breakthrough into my life, can God also bring a breakthrough in my family? Of course he can. If God can bring a breakthrough in my life and in my family, what else can God do in my church, right? If God can bring a breakthrough in my life and my family and our church, what else can God do in our community when we return to his word? And if God can bring a breakthrough to my life and my family and our church and our community, what else can God do? in our nation when we return to God's word. And what else can God do in every country in the world? You see, the possibilities are limitless. When you get into God's word and you prioritize it and you start seeing all the great things that God has done throughout history, it fires you up to say, if I prioritize his word in my life, what else can God do? That's a question that I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see God answer. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just, again, reading the Word of God. Oh, and I was uh, just texting someone <laughs> the Word of God. Oh, ah. that's good. Good comeback. Speaking of the Word of God, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is God-breathed mm -hmm. and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. Listen to this, verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
Amen. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> and so uh, the Word of God is such an important instrument for us as believers. It tells us the history of God. It tells us how God is moving, what He wants from us, mm. how, as Ryan said, how it blesses us, um, how it forms our character. And so if we're going to see God move, as Brian, uh, Pastor Ryan has challenged us, we need to get back to making the Word of God our priority. Yeah, and I think the key is our priority, our final priority, you know, our final authority. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when we agree with God's word, when we disagree, when we like what it says, when we don't like what it says, when we understand it, when we agree, disagree, it's just, if it's God's word, we need to get back to saying, that's my authority. And when we do that, God says, now you're ready to see me move. Yeah, and so there's a difference between wrestling with something you're not sure you understand. So mm -hmm. there's going to be lots of things in scriptures. As pastors, we deal with this all the time. It's like, okay, what was God's intention in this? What does he want from us? Uh, I find that the biggest challenge for, for people following God is that we have a truth box, and we know God's truth box, mm -hmm. and we even understand what God's calling us to do, but we just don't always like it. Right, right, right yeah. And so we take our truth box, and sometimes it's because of our own weaknesses or our own desires, and we put it above God's, and that's where we find ourselves in trouble. Yeah. It's what happened <laughs> right all the way from the beginning, right, in the yeah. garden, where Adam and Eve, God says, listen, you know, here's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't pick it. It will bring death. It's not a good thing. Trust me. And they pick the fruit yeah. and ever since then we have been trying to seek our own truth make ourselves mm -hmm. god above god when god says i'm god here's my truth follow it and it will go well for you yeah and in those times when you're tempted to put your truth box above god just remember the words that god says in isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 through 9 he says for my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways declares the lord mm. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So next time you think you might know something God doesn't know, just take a look at how high the heavens are and go, yeah, we're not even on the same playing field as him. So God, I like what you said earlier, too. Um, um, you were talking about how... Um, do what you do know. How'd you say Right, yeah. So, yeah. you know, sometimes we get bogged down. Like, we're still learning. We don't know everything about the Bible. We're yeah, always a work in progress. <laughs> we're learning every day something from God's Word. And, yeah. and sometimes we use it as a crutch. Like, well, I don't know what this verse means, so I'm done. It's like, no, no, no. Okay, well, while you're trying to figure out what that verse means, these three verses over here, you know what God wants you to do. Do them as you're learning what the other verse means. And yeah. I think that's what we need to do. If you only under, if you only understand two verses in the Bible, then start, you start, start obeying there. those two yeah. verses and, yeah. and God will help you. He'll help you get the others down. But what you do know, act on and then learn and ask questions to figure out the rest. Yeah, so if you don't know what to do with mold in the Old Testament, <laughs> you know, wrestle with we'll that one a little. Okay you that. know, it's okay. But you do know to be a peacemaker yeah. and to love your enemy and to, to obey your parents and to tell the truth. You mm -hmm. know, so... Yeah, it's a really good truth. So, hey, I want to pray uh, and close us out and uh, just ask God to bless you and to teach us. So, Lord, as we continue to look at your word, mm. I pray that we would continue to be students that would slow down and listen to what you're speaking through your word to us, that the character of Christ would be formed mm. in us and that you would work through us as we look at your word. So, Lord, thank you for all the resources and tools that, that you give us and the people around us and the teachers that you give us. Help us to discern and have wisdom and, and uh, to know what it means to, to follow the word of God. And we ask that you continue to um, show us how we can be part of how you're moving, Lord Jesus, as we continue with our faces down, our mm. palms up, in humility, seeking your face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As always, when life gives you lemons, make, make lemonade. lemonade. God bless you.